for now. Um, cool. Well, thank you everybody for joining uh, us today for our first sustainability at home talk uh, today, bringing together some students at Anderson who are all focused on sustainability in different ways and talking about how we have incorporated sustainability into our choices and actions at home and then talking a little bit about some of the big picture things that we think about as well. So I'm joined today by Christina Muller, who does a lot of work when it comes to sustainability in the built environment, um, and is someone who I connected with very early at Anderson, because we're in the same section, um, talking about sustainability and different ways that we can reduce waste and sort of incorporate better practices um, at Anderson. And then Carol, who is the president of Net Impact. Everybody knows that Carol is very passionate about sustainability work, and we're really glad to have her here. Uh, Steven Rosenman, our first inaugural uh, VP of Sustainability with ASA, uh, really leading the charge of sustainability at Anderson. Uh, and I'm really grateful for his leadership um, and the opportunity to be able to follow in his footsteps uh, as on the ASA Council. And then Laura Richardson, who's the president of the Energy Management Group, um, who uh, also from Section D, we have a lot of Section D here today, um, who's gonna be talking a little bit about some of the energy choices we can make at home um, and thinking about how we can incorporate renewables uh, into or how we get electricity at home. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have each person talk for about four or five minutes about some of the things that they, um, some of the sustainability practices that they incorporate uh, into what they do at home. And we've sort of chatted amongst ourselves. So we're talking about some of our topics kind of build on one another, but we're trying to make sure that we're, we're covering different things. Um, and then we're gonna have a little bit of a conversation about some of the things that we think uh, we can do with the bit in the kind of bigger picture things outside of just our actions at home. Uh, and then we will open it up to questions from you guys. I'm sure that many of you also have things that you do at home when it comes to trying to be more sustainable and reducing waste. And we would love to hear your tips as well. Um, and of course, if you have any questions for us. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Christina, who's going to kick us off. Hi guys, uh, I'm Christina and I'm going to be talking to you about reducing waste in your kitchen, which I thought would be appropriate as I'm sure um, most of you are cooking from home more nowadays. So um, I'm just going to walk you guys through the process of my process of storing food after I get home from the grocery store. Um, and I'd like to preface this by saying that although some of this may seem a bit tedious, it requires so little effort but makes such a big difference, you know. So preserving food means less food waste, it means less trip to the grocery store, which is better for both the environment and your wallet. Um, so when I get back from the grocery store, I'll empty the contents of all my bags on the counters. I'll separate the items that need to be refrigerated beforehand. So I'm not just standing there with the fridge door open um, as I put things away. This not only saves electricity, but it can also extend the life of your fridge because the compressor, um, which is the component that keeps um, the fridge cool, doesn't have to like, work as hard to bring the fridge back to the set temperature. Um, I'll usually leave my fruit, vegetables, and herbs out uh, because I need to prepare them to be stored, which sounds really intense, but it only takes a minute or two. Uh, so first, I'll rinse the produce. Um, if you want, you can rinse certain fruits in, um, it's a white vinegar uh, water solution. I believe it's one part vinegar to four part water, um, and it kills any mold spores, spores that have formed. Um, I'll also remove rubber bands, um, which are surprisingly useful to have on hand. Um, and then for washing most smaller items like berries or Brussels sprouts, I'll use a salad spinner. Um, it makes drying super quick and easy. Um, I'll then line the original packaging or whatever bowl I'm going to store it in with a paper towel. And this absorbs the moisture and prevents mold and sogginess. So, I also do this with items that don't need to be washed, like pre-washed lettuces and spinach. Um, so just stick a paper towel on top before you put it in the fridge. And I swear to you, it will double the life of your produce, especially spinach. Um, so after everything's washed, I'll quickly like inspect um, and remove anything that looks overly ripe or bruised. Um, this doesn't mean that I'm in inspecting every individual blueberry. I'll quickly grab a handful and if anything feels or looks super soft, I'll pull it out. Um, and I'm not doing this because I'm crazy, I'm doing it for a reason. Um, so ripening or bruised fruit releases a hormone called ethylene, um, which is responsible for regulating the plant's growth and development. Um, and I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the phrase, one bad apple ruins a bunch. Um, that, well, that's literally because the ethylene gas released by one bad apple will cause all the other apples around it to spoil. 
So some fruits like bananas, pears, apples release more ethylene gas than others. So like in addition to removing the overripe fruit when I wash, I'll also store these high ethylene releasing fruits in a separate area. Um, and I'm not like throwing the overripe fruit away. Like I'll eat it as a snack, usually as I'm, as I'm sorting because I'm typically hungry when I get back from the grocery store. Um, for herbs, um, I usually cut off I have a little example here. Um, I cut off the bottom of the stems, place it in a glass of water, and I'll store it in the fridge um, or on my windowsill. Uh, during quarantine, I've actually gotten really into propagating produce um, that I buy from the grocery store. Um, there are many online resources that can help explain how to propagate a particular item. Um, for vegetables, it usually involves just like cutting off the stem um, and placing it in a cup of water in, in a well-lit area. So this is like actually some lettuce that I propagated. So you can see where I cut it originally. Um, and this is all new growth right here. So um, I'm going to probably be planting that soon. Um, and oh yeah, this is a side note. I also bought a bottle cutter. Um, it was about 20 to $30 on Amazon. Um, and you can repurpose beer bottles, wine glass, wine bottles, like jars um, into cups or even like planters. Um, people have used them as, for candles or decor items. Uh, my friend actually um, used one of these to make a chandelier of beer bottles above his pool table. It looked really sick. But here's an example of like, this is a, a wine bottle that I turned into a water cup. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but two other products that I really love. Um, these are silicone baggies, um, which eliminate the need for Ziploc bags. And then I also have this silicon um, oven and grill mat, um, which replaces aluminum foil. Um, and there are certain health risks associated with aluminum, so that's just another benefit. Um, awesome. Thank you, Christina. That's great. Um, I feel like I just learned some new things, uh, which is awesome. Uh, Carol, over to you. Yeah, so it's just building off of where she started with Food waste, I just want to emphasize why reducing food waste is so important. Uh, reducing food waste has been identified by Project Drawdown as one of the most, if not the most effective thing that we can do to curb emissions in the next few years. And um, the reason is because when food goes to landfills, it doesn't have the right oxygen or nutrients to decompose like it would in other scenarios and it releases much more harmful emissions than anything else that goes into landfills. So reducing food waste is vitally important. Um, so improving, extending the life of it in the ways that Christina mentioned is really important, but also um, if you can compost, uh, it's, I've actually found it to be somewhat difficult to find composting locations in West LA, but if you live closer to Echo Park, um, or if you are about to graduate and will have some disposable income, you can actually pay for a compost pickup. I think it's at $30 a month here um, around LA. If you live in other cities, there's, I think, much more accessible composting. Um, when I lived in New York, I could drop off my composting at a farmer's market just down the street from me once a week. So please look up where there's available composting around you or if you could pay for pickup if you do have that income. Um, because like I said, it, it, reducing our food waste is, is like vitally important to curbing emissions over the next few years. Um, also, in terms of reducing other types of waste, uh, clothing is a major source of waste. There's 21 billion pounds of textile waste that goes to landfill each year in the U.S. alone, let alone internationally. Um, and the major way to reduce that is to curb our consumption of new clothes. We are in this, we're caught in this kind of loop of buying um, based on the latest trends and um, only I think about 30% of our, clo our, our closets are actually used on average in the US. So um, people tend to throw away their clothes um, pretty quickly or after much, uh, a lot earlier than it's actually um, lived its full life. So when you are buying new clothes, especially now, uh, I know a lot of us are in indulging in a lot more e-commerce shopping. Make sure that you're buying things that you're actually going to wear um, and that have a long life, have high quality. Uh, if possible, buy secondhand. So I encourage you to check out um, ThreadUp, Poshmark, um, uh, the real, real uh, other ways to buy secondhand online and in person, of course, when that's open. Um, I've had a lot of luck finding 
really great items in consignment shops, um, and they, I promise you, are not that gross, dingy clothing that you might consider for, um, from consignment shops. You've probably seen me wearing a lot of clothes that I've got from consignment shops. Um, so buy secondhand whenever possible, and then when you're done with your clothes, please don't throw them out into landfill, donate them to um, Goodwill or textile recycling um, <laughs> uh, locations, um, or do a clothing swap with your friends. That's a really um, great way to, to exchange clothes. Um, and then lastly, I just want to talk about waste from overall shopping and consumption in e-commerce. Um, a majority of returns, especially from e-commerce, actually go straight to landfill because it takes more time and effort to uh, restock them than is worth for the companies. And so I think there's about 5 billion pounds of waste that goes to landfill from e-commerce, and most of which is not effect, uh, defective. It's just things that people decide that they don't want. Um, so think about that when you're doing your online shopping or especially during the gifting season um, and gifting towards others as much as possible, uh, reduce the demand for the consumption of goods and gift um, experiences, digital subscriptions, or upcycled items. Awesome. Thanks, Carol. Uh, and Stephen, I'm going to hand it to you now. Perfect. Um, awesome. Well, first off, Charlotte, thank you for organizing this. Um, definitely a good way to uh, kick off the sustainability efforts for ASA, uh, given the, the virtual nature of everything. Um, and then second, I think, uh, you know, we have some Slack channels out there, pretty informal, but, um, you know, this is one of those areas that I think crowdsourcing ideas is super valuable. It's kind of like the basis for why we kicked off this panel. Um, but I know I've gotten a lot of ideas from some of the people on this call, Robbie, Ryan, um, things that I'll be talking about that they've done and I was inspired by. So um, definitely look forward for like ways that we could um, just kind of compile a list of things and pass that on and, and just, you know, crowdsource ideas from our classmates. Um, before jumping in, I think one of the principles that's like tough to, that a lot, that kind of prevents a lot of people from, you know, starting some of these sustainability practices is the idea that perfect is the enemy of good. This is something that like really struck me. I heard from um, a, one of my like career idols in the sustainability world who says, just because I drive a pickup truck and travel to go skiing doesn't mean I can't be an environmentalist. Um, and so I think that's like a really big notion for people to get through their heads because a lot of the time they hear about all these things that you're doing, you know, going fully off grid, whatever it might be, that sounds so extreme, so overwhelming. And there's like so many different aspects of life that you can think about taking different steps to become more sustainable. Um, but it's important to recognize that it's just, you know, one thing at a time and chipping away in small um, little chunks can really have a substantial impact. Um, so um, yeah, I'm going to talk about some food packaging um, and drink packaging stuff as well. Um, starting with like just water bottles and reusable mugs. Um, so this is something that, uh, you know, a few years before our class got there, um, Anderson added the flow water stations. We those <laughs> have a lot of headaches with those, but they've added a few new water bottle refilling stations that I think has really made things a lot more seamless. It's so easy to bring a water bottle to campus. You can also leave one, an extra one in your locker. Um, you know, tons of companies are like giving out water bottles and like reusable um, mugs at some of these, like, you know, all the, the, the various recruiting efforts. And so just leave one that you're not like stoked on <laughs> from a certain company, like in your locker. Uh, so if you do forget one, to bring one one day, um, you have it there and can go use that to refill up um, from a like reusable coffee mug or like a clean canteen or hydro flask type thing. Um, it's definitely beneficial to bring those because um, Anderson Cafe also gives you, um, they'll charge you, I think, 25 or 35 cents less um, for a coffee. So you're saving money by bringing that or just having that on campus. Super easy to, to wash out um, with water, either in the sink in the student lounge or to bring home and just toss in the dishwasher and bring another one the next day. Um, I think the biggest thing with those is really just getting into the habit. Um, once you do, and once you're in the habit of tossing a water bottle or a reusable um, mug into your backpack, like it's just second nature. So leaving it out the night before or putting it in your backpack and, you know, come home, wash it, 
put another one in as soon as you take it out is just like a really good way to get in that initial habit. Uh, and then I think that just kind of instills uh, pretty consistent behavior. Uh, and then from the food perspective, um, I use Tupperware a ton. I got some as soon as I moved out here. Um, I don't love cooking a ton. And so when I do, I am, but I do cook a ton. Um, so, you know, if I'm going to make a meal one night, I'm going to make, try to make it for like two or three meals worth. So cooking a full pound of pasta and putting other stuff in it um, and putting that into Tupperware. Uh, and if I can get it into like single meal portions that, you know, this is my lunch for tomorrow or lunch for two days from now. Um, just having like good reusable Tupperwares. There's a, you know, super easy to find on Amazon or something. Plenty that are like strong enough now and like high quality that you can like put soups in and stuff like that. Uh, again, just another habit thing of getting into the practice of tossing that in your backpack um, and bringing to campus. Um, Quick plug for the uh, reusable utensil <laughs> initiative that we launched this year. Um, that's another one. You know, it's so easy. They're so lightweight. Just having utensils in your backpack, and it doesn't have to be the ones that we gave you in that little kit. I know that the little container is like has some tiny utensils in there. You can put regular sized ones in from home. That's another one that you know I'd get home from Anderson Afternoons, take it out, put the used utensils right into the dishwasher, and take new ones from my cabinet and just like pop them back in there. So I had four the next day that I was going to campus. Um, so that's another easy one. And then finally, just like two items that I've gotten into using more. One is bees wrap. I think this was probably like a Robbie wiper inspired one um, or Ryan. I think they're always bringing like sandwiches. This is something super easy to like just wrap around a sandwich or bread um, and bring to campus. And then Christina mentioned this, but the reusable, um, Ziplocs, that's another one. I go hiking a ton, and so if I wanna take like some trail mix out with me, instead of using a reusable bag, every or a single use plastic bag every single time, just using that and putting it in my backpack is like super easy. You can just rinse it out, flip it inside out. It's like super easy to wash. So um, yeah, I think that's it for me. Awesome, thanks Steven. And I really appreciate what you said about don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. I think that that, um, we all want to hold ourselves to high standards about these things, but that can often make it feel like you have to be perfect to try doing any one of these things and, you know, small, yeah, incremental change is still change. Um, great. Laura, want to wanna talk to us about energy in our homes? Okay. I just wanted to share um, some graphs and stuff. Can you guys see it? Okay. Big fan of graphs. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a nice segue from what Stephen was saying that, you know, we can do little things to um, improve the, the greenness of the, the grid and, um, and like not only our personal actions, but pressuring government um, and other entities to take action. And I think the COVID crisis has really shown us that, you know, personal action is like important, but it's not enough because you see the, um, the greenhouse gas reductions that have occurred and it's very impressive, but it's, it's not enough even to get us to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So really need governments to step up and incentivize innovation uh, in the renewable industry and other kinds of electrification. So um, this graph is for the levelized cost of energy for wind and solar. And the point of this is that um, in the US and in other countries, there have been incentives, um, mostly tax credits, that um, have really brought down the cost of installing wind and solar such that it's the cheapest energy source, uh, new energy source to install in the US, um, in most regions really. So you can really see how, um, like how much it's dropped and, and how like, people have innovated. So um, the point is like we need some sort of policy mechanism to incentivize people to uh, innovate and and create these solutions um, so that we can do this in affordable in an affordable way for people. Um, so knowing that there's like different ways that you can procure green energy from your utility, and it really depends on what your utility is. And depending where you live after graduation, you just need to look and see like your utility provider, like what, are they an investor owned utility or publicly? Because there's all these different programs and they make it very confusing. Um, but once you kind of understand where you're starting, you can figure it out. So for example, like Southern California Edison has a page on like different 
green rates for homes and businesses. Um, but I believe Southern California Edison is also covered by a community choice aggregator, which is essentially a um, government body going and procuring um, generally solar energy and then using SCE's um, transmission and distribution to, um, to bring that to people's homes. Um, and, and it's often cheaper than, than conventional. So that's kind of the awesome thing about, about um, these CCAs. So you can see what, what, um, what options you have. You can see you can do like a leaner option or clean power or 100% and there's differences between like offsets or full procurement. Um, so you have to look into that, but um, going along with, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. If we can put a little bit of dollars into, um, into this, into incentivizing renewable power, then um, that's a great thing to do. So the next thing is, um, well, I have LADWP, which um, I don't know if any of you guys also have them, but like they're stuck in the 1990s or something. So, um, sorry, I'm having trouble going to the, to the next page. So they have some options too, but unfortunately this adds, um, this adds extra costs to your, your utility bill. So um, that's like not really ideal, especially because I showed you the cost curves, it's supposed to be cheaper. So, um, you know, we really need to pressure politicians to, um, to make these mandates for, for renewable portfolio standards and um, really like make people in, implement solutions that are cheaper um, and renewable, which is the reality right now. So the other thing that you can do is look, um, this is the CAISO, so California Independent System Operator, and you can look at the uh, renewable trends day by day. Um, so this is yesterday. Um, so you can see that, um, you know, as expected, the green line is solar, so ramping up during the daytime, and then, um, you know, natural gas, hydro, um, uh, batteries kind of filling in the, the rest there. California is a pretty green grid. We don't have any coal. Um, so if you move elsewhere in the country, it might look a lot different. You know, in Texas, you have a lot of wind at night. Um, so you can look at your, your individual state, wherever you live. Um, but the point here is, you know, if you um, could change some small habits, like running your dishwasher when you leave to go to work in the morning instead of running it at night, um, then you can take advantage of this. Um, and my last thing is that, you know, there's um, different organizations that can help educate you on, on voting for, for elections, both, you know, presidential or um, senators um, or, you know, smaller things. And they'll give um, different trade organizations, you know, obviously coming from a place of, of their own bias, but um, can give their perspective if you want to support that particular position. So there's two main organizations I'll suggest, the American Wind Energy Association and the Solar um, Energy Industry Association, and they have all kinds of different um, policy bulletins and um, you can read about it there. Awesome, thanks Laura. Um, and for those of you who maybe are, um, want to make sure that you're able to uh, look up all this information later, we're going to put all of this together uh, in a Google uh, sheet that we, or yeah, in a document that we'll share with everybody. Um, so that way you can, if you want to go look into when exactly the energy or renewable energy is our the majority of uh, electricity during the day and see when those time cutoffs off, time cutoffs are, you'll be able to look it up. Um, okay, so I'm going to speak about a few, um, a few more things before we sort of transition to talking about bigger picture um, sustainability efforts. So, uh, you know, I think a lot about the R's of sustainability, right? The reduce, reuse, repair, uh, refuse, recycle. Um, so I'm going to kind of put this in the three buckets of repair, reduce, and uh, recycle. So, yeah, my first plug is going to be about repairing things. Um, this is often like the, I think that sometimes we don't have enough uh, faith and confidence in ourselves to think when something is broken or not working the way that we would expect, taking that moment to think like, can I fix this? Um, and to me, this is more just like a mindset than really even that much uh, skill 
because all of the information is on the internet it's, and on YouTube. It's really just this mindset of, can I try to repair this? Can I look this up? Um, and so this is something that I really try, um, really try to do is like, okay, if something is broken, um, yeah, how can I fix this? And I think one of the things, one of the ways that this comes up is with clothing. And, you know, Carol already talked about how textile waste is a huge source uh, of waste in the, um, in our waste stream. But to me, like, it doesn't even have to be, you know, like a full, um, you know, a full sewing machine, but even just having like a little, uh, yeah, like a little sewing kit with a needle and a, a little bit of thread and just trying a few simple repairs really makes a difference. Um, so that's going to be like the first plug, the second, and I don't normally like when, uh, plugging you to buy things for sustainability because that seems of course like counterintuitive. This one's going to be a little bit funny, but I swear to God, a hot glue gun really goes a really far way in fixing a lot of things because so much of what often I find happens is that you've basically broken a piece of plastic um, and something about what you've broken has now made this like unusable, but a hot glue gun or some epoxy can fix that and make the, instead of throwing that away, now you can continue using it. I will also say that a lot of my sustainability tips are kind of on the verge between just me being really cheap and sustainability, but I think it's okay that it, it's both of these things. Um, you know, so I would say, you know, like some simple sewing, I think of as kind of like level one with fixing things, uh, you know, like hot glue gun, epoxy, and thinking about, uh, yeah, that kind of is like level two with fixing things. And then I would say level three is <laughs> like a soldering gun for fixing um, wires when like your headphones break and things like that. Um, but that's like expert level, it takes a while to get there. More than anything, I encourage you all to, like next time something breaks that seems like it might not be that hard to fix, spend five minutes on YouTube looking up if you can fix it. Um, and yeah, to me it's about the mindset. Uh, second thing I will say is about um, one of my big things with re redu reducing is reusable napkins. Um, so I keep a pile of probably, uh, I probably have like 30 or 40 of these reusable napkins that I've made on my sewing machine, but you could buy them, whatever. Um, and to me, the key is that they're always on a stack on my kitchen table. I use them when I'm eating, but also like if there's like a quick spill to clean up to use these instead of paper towels and I keep a, like a basket in my kitchen and I just wash them every time that I do my laundry. Um, and it's, yeah, one of these simple things that we can all do to, to reduce, um, yeah, reduce paper towels. Uh, and then the last thing I want to say is about recycling. Um, I know that there's a lot of concern about the future of recycling right now. Starting in 2018, China implemented a new policy called the National Sword Policy, and the implication has basically been that the U.S., which has been highly dependent on exporting a lot of our uh, recycling commodities, namely plastic and paper, um, that China and then subsequently most countries in Asia have stopped taking U.S. recycling. And I'm sure that this is something that many of you have heard about. Um, yes, this is true. Yes, it also has some pretty um, severe impacts when it comes to, honestly, recycled goods being landfilled. And so a lot of people have asked me in the last year, um, you know, does this mean that I should still recycle? Like, does it even matter? Uh, and my answer is yes, it does. Because even if, even if some of that stuff is getting landfilled, which it is, like, I'll be honest, yes, like some of those recycled goods are being landfilled, the amount of time it takes to get people, it has taken us so long to get in the habit of recycling that if we start to get out of that habit, it's gonna take us as a society a really long time to get back in the habit of recycling. So for me, it's partially about maintaining just the practice of recycling. Um, and then sort of two major things that we can all do uh, to improve recycling is one, never put plastic bags in your recycling. Um, that's both like don't, plastic bags are not recyclable by um, like industrial recovery, uh, material recovery processing plants, um, but also they like mess up the machines. And so really avoid putting plastic bags uh, into your recycling and to rinse things out before you put them in the recycling. Um, this is one that uh, I didn't realize what a huge different th difference this made, um, but oftentimes when we're recycling things that haven't been rinsed out yet, they just automatically get put into the landfill. So really rinse your 
like rinse out that plastic container or that bottle before you throw it in your recycling bin. It makes a big difference. Um, and if you're curious about what plastics can be recycled in the city of LA and also Santa Monica, it's all plastics labeled one on the bottom. You always see that triangle, it'll have a number. Plastics one through seven are recyclable in LA. Um, in LA and in Santa Monica, outside of those numbers are not recyclable. And if it doesn't have a number on it, it's not recyclable. Um, so those are some of my plugs about recycling. Don't put in plastic bags and rinse it out before you put it in. Um, so I think I'm sure that also many of you have other tips about at home, uh, things we can do with uh, sustainability. I know that even our sort of internal list of things that we were all talking about was even longer than that, but we wanted to sort of focus on a few different areas that we think can make a difference. Um, but of course, like we're talking about kind of what can feel like small actions at home, right? Of like extending the life of your produce by washing it really carefully and uh, thinking about how you can extend that life and some of these different uh, questions. And I think it would be an incomplete conversation if we didn't also talk about what are some of the big, um, what are some of the big picture things that we think about with our own personal actions um, that make a difference. And so I've asked everyone to kind of think about that and talk for a few minutes about what are those big picture things that you think about with your personal actions and, and honestly, what do you struggle with too? Um, so sort of in the same order down the panel, I'm gonna ask you guys to chat about that. So Christina, I'll hand it to you first. Um, so I come from a background in real estate sustainability. Um, you know, I, I learned that buildings contribute to 40% of greenhouse gas emissions, which is just staggering. Um, a majority of the innovation that's happening in this space is at the commercial level. Um, but I try to think about the attributes that you can look at when you're buying a home or even making modifications to your existing home. I'm not anywhere close to buying my own home, but um, hopefully you can use some of this um, in a few years later down the line. So um, a major element in energy conservation is insulation. Um, for those of you who don't know, insulation reduces the heat, the exchange of heat um, through the surfaces of the building. So this can be done in many ways. Um, you can install high quality insulation. You can use poly seal foam to seal the cracks in between um, the joists and boards. Um, but another area that I think people overlook is the type of glass that's used for your windows. Um, so roughly 70% of energy loss occurs through windows and doors. Um, this can be reduced by using products like low E glass, which stands for low emission. Um, and this is glass that has a coating that minimizes the amount um, of UV and infrared light. Um, and um, it doesn't compromise the amount of visible light. So essentially it just keeps the heat from entering and exiting the space without affecting the amount of natural light that comes through. Um, another typical energy hog in your home is your HVAC system. So um, I actually worked on a project prior to Anderson um, and we placed temperature controls in units in every room, which was convenient for our tenants because most people prefer different temperature levels, but it was also the more sustainable option because you're heating and cooling a smaller space, which is less energy intensive. Um, we also installed tankless water heaters as opposed to conventional um, storage water heaters. Um, we try to do all Energy Star and Water Sense labeled fixtures and appliances to ensure that we were using the most energy and water efficient products out there. Um, I encourage you guys to visit the U.S. Green Building Council's website. Um, it's www.usgbc.org. Um, search for the LEED, L-E-E-D, rating system, um, which serves as a checklist of initiatives. Um, and like, even though you aren't gonna be certifying your own home, which is technically possible, um, it's a helpful resource to reference like when incorporating sustainable features into your home. Um, and it can cover topics like water and energy efficiency, material sourcing, indoor air quality, selecting sustainable sites, rainwater management, and more. Um, two other websites that I like to reference are the Living Building Challenge and GRESB, it's G-R-E-S-B. Um, those are also helpful resources you can utilize. Cool. So big picture stuff. Um, I, when I, if anyone knows me, I might sound like a broken record, but eating a plant-rich diet is also really important. Um, 
beyond beyond so we talk I, I mentioned how food waste is is one of the highest ranked things by project drawdown so is eating plant-based so um the reason is that i mean if you everyone i think it's really common knowledge how much emissions uh oil and gas has um the agriculture industry has just as many emissions as oil and gas i actually think it contributes one percent more to our, of of our overall emissions comes from agriculture alone uh, and that's because of how dependent we are on meat and um, how much land that takes up, how much water it takes, how much energy it takes to feed um, our livestock, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I think we're going to talk a little bit about going vegetarian or, or, or fully vegan once a week. Um, I, if it's possible, do more. Um, I think there's this movement to vote with your uh, vote with your dollar and vote with your fork, but the reality is that only so many people actually have access to vote with their dollar and vote with their fork. Um, you know, a lot of folks don't have food available to be able to make those mindful choices about what they're eating. So if you do have access to that, then you should be educated about what you're eating and what impacts that has on the environment um, and, and do as much as you possibly can, in, in my opinion. Um, also, just in terms of this along the same lines, um, we are, you know, we will be folks who have more education, more disposable income, but again, not everyone will. So we really need collective action and advocacy um, with, uh, at the governmental level to ensure that there are, um, you know, policies in place to, um, to make corporations make these meaningful impact uh, changes to make recycling, you know, uh, put the infrastructure in for recycling and for um, composting to have really effective um, climate policy overall. Um, right now, I think there's a lot of talk about how um, COVID is beneficial for our environment because it's reducing um, transportation and emissions, but the reality is that not it's not cutting emissions as much as you might expect for the really high um, social uh, and economic cost that's come with it. And on the flip side, companies and um, uh, politicians are actually using this opportunity where people are looking away to reinstate some really harmful environmental policies. So um, voting often, voting locally is vitally important and knowing what, uh, who, you, what who you're voting for who you're voting for, what they stand for in terms of um, uh, environmental policies. They're big picture items for me. Awesome. Um, so I think, you know, when thinking about big picture, this is kind of like the switch in my mind from sustainability to climate change. Um, and, you know, a lot of the things we've been talking about thus far, reducing waste um, is, and you know, from a business perspective, you think about sustainable supply chains. Um, you know, for me, there's a you know, bigger picture changes that are more important are really around climate change legislation um, and at the policy level. Um, you can do, you know, you can change light bulbs, you can um, use your reusable ASA utensils, but that's really not stopping um, climate change. Uh, and so it's really important to think about that as, as the, the key focal point um, in all of this, even while we're taking some of the small measures. Um, so there's a lot that I, you know, try to, to follow to stay up to date on this. Um, if you look at or follow the, the OAC Instagram, you'll see that I post a lot of stuff from an organization called Protect Our Winners. Um, Christina talked about, you know, how our backgrounds kind of shape the angle we come at climate change and sustainability from, and that definitely is true for me. Um, I'm, you know, love the outdoors. I spend as much time as I can in the mountains, in the ocean. And so the changes there that impact the, my ability to do the things that I love is really what's driving me to like care about this stuff. Um, and I think that goes for everyone. You don't have to, you know, go trail running and hiking and do all like things for your whole life. But if you enjoy going and hiking, um, you know, once a month up uh, West Ridge on a, like a short, you know, OAC and wine hike and being able to see downtown, um, which is only like 10 miles away um, and not have air pollution be that bad. You know, those are some of the things that I think it, it affects all of us. Um, so Protect Our Winners is a really cool organization, nonprofit, started by outdoor athletes, 
really mobilizing the outdoor community. Um, and their premise is that the outdoor state, people who care about the outdoor industry, are you know larger than most states population-wise um, in the U.S. And so that's a really powerful force, but it really hasn't been mobilized in a way to combat um, you know like the fossil fuel industry and the money and the the lobbyists that they have working for them to really prevent a lot of um, climate advocacy or climate change policies making it through um, at all levels of government. So that's a really cool organization to check out. Another site that I look at for my news on this is grist, G-R-I-S-T dot org. Um, they have things, you know, across what we've talked about from sustainability innovations to climate change to um, the pol policy angle of this. Uh, I've read a lot of, try to read their articles pretty regularly um, and have found a lot of companies uh, on there that I've researched and tried to network with as well from a professional standpoint. So really great resource there. Um, and then one of my favorite books is called Getting Green Done. It's written by Auden Schendler, who is uh, kind of my career, the, from that Parker exercise, he was my career idol um, that we did, I think, like during orientation or the first summer quarter. Um, he is the VP of sustainability at Aspen Ski Company. Um, Aspen's one of the most, or definitely the most progressive mountain in terms of the sustainability efforts they've done and implemented. Um, they go to DC lobbying, um, using really the power that they have. Uh, and his point um, throughout the book uh, that I think is like really valuable and something that all of us can take with us is to like leverage your greatest strength in affecting change. So he looked at Aspen and said, you know, we can switch to 100% renewables, we can get rid of single use cups in our cafeterias. But our greatest strength is that we are the most, one of the most world famous uh, ski destinations out there. And so we have people coming from all over the US, all over the world, especially a lot of people with a lot of money coming into this small town in the middle of Colorado, and they have an incredible ability to influence um, hundreds of thousands or millions of visitors every year. And so that's the, the angle he's taken. So it's really, you know, leverage what is your greatest power for a lot of us that's coming at this from a business standpoint. Um, that was definitely like my goal, you know, help companies solve their biggest sustainability challenges. You know, that's where I'm going to plug in. I'm not a policy expert. Um, I'm not an architect expert. So I'm not going to be able to really hit sustainability and climate change from those angles, but I can from the private sector standpoint. And so um, would definitely encourage all of you to think about that. You know, it can be as something as small as if you're, you know, a yoga teacher talking about the environment and the importance of a, a clean environment and giving back to the planet in your classes uh, is a really great way to just spread the message and importance of um, sustainability and protecting the planet. So my uh, big picture is kind of similar to, to what I talked about first, but just that we have the power to vote with our voices and our wallets and our ballots. And I think a good anecdote for that is um, I was working in wind energy before and I had the opportunity to go lobby in DC for, for some um, wind policy issues. And um, I had just got my US citizenship like two months ago or something. So it was kind of exciting like culmination of that. Um, and going and speaking to lawmakers on both sides of the aisle about um, different policy efforts. And um, it was interesting to see like the bipartisan support for those when, when things make sense economically and they um, support their, their districts. And um, there are a lot of different policies than just you know, climate change related. It's also you know, making electricity affordable for, for everyone. Some, um, the, the equity there um, and also tax policy and grants for research and new product development. Um, there's all kinds of different initiatives and I think um, legislation can help us get, um, you know, so some of these individual actions people are taking are, you know, you're also financially incentivized to, to take those and to repair things and to recycle. Um, so I think, yeah, it was really inspiring to see like how when you go and you put yourself out there and you talk to people about something that you care about, they actually listen to you. Uh, that kind of surprised me, to be honest. And um, so I think that's really exciting and, and something that I would encourage everyone to do. Awesome. Um, and I'm going to give one, uh, yeah, I'm going to 
the big picture thing that I think about is transportation. Um, that's the place where I feel honestly like pretty torn, right? Like I, um, yeah, I ride my bike to campus or I take the bus. I feel like probably when it comes to my carbon emissions, like day to day when it comes to transportation, I feel like I'm probably doing an okay job. Um, but I also used to work in international development and social impact and was like flying to Latin America and Africa a few times a year. Um, and like, I think, uh, actually, <laughs> I think it was in the strategy class we were talking about um, game theory and Laura, I thought had like a really good description of game theory as flying that like, if you know everyone else is gonna fly to cool destinations, then when, why should I make the choice to not fly and not have that experience when everyone else is doing it? And then it sort of incentivizes all of us to like keep traveling and keep going to these places. Um, and so, you know, to be very honest, like I'm, I'm still figuring it out um, when it comes to flying. And so I'm not saying there's a perfect answer here because I also think coming from an international development perspective, like I think it's really important that we engage with our world and think about how big this planet is and how many different kinds of people there are in different places. And that a lot of travel, I think actually inspires some of these for people to get motivated about conservation and to really think about some of these things. Um, so I think there's a lot of really important things about travel, but I do encourage you to all think about, you know, like for example, I have a lot of family up in San Francisco. I try to drive to San Francisco instead of fly, right? Like, is that a little bit inconvenient? Sure. Is it a huge difference in the total number of hours it takes to fly versus drive? Not that big of a difference. And so I think cutting down on some of those sorts of things when you can, I think, you know, cumulatively make a difference. And so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have like the perfect answer for it, but I do encourage you guys to think about, okay, can I take the expo line downtown instead of an Uber? Can I take the bus to campus or ride my bike instead of paying a thousand dollars for a parking pass? Like some of those transportation decisions I do think kind of make, um, that's, it's our 30% of our person, like gen the typical American, 30% of your emissions are from transportation. So let's try to think about how we can cut that down. Um, Okay, so we have about 10 minutes left. Um, if anybody in the audience has any questions or comments that they want to contribute to the conversation, that'd be great. Um, either you can type them in the chat or just unmute yourself. Um, otherwise, of course, I have plenty of questions to ask our panelists, but um, I'm going to pause for a few minutes, see if anybody else has any comments or questions, thoughts they want to share. Or other things that y'all do. Yeah, I saw that um, Robbie put in a, a link about imperfect, uh, the imperfect foods blogs about, um, yeah, notes on storing stuff in your kitchen. That's great. Yeah, I had a conversation with my mom about that yesterday, not to put the apples with the kale. We were wondering, she was wondering why the kale was spoiling so fast, and it's because all the apples were in the drawer with the kale. Um, so little things like that that you might not think about, I think can go a long way in keeping food fresh. Uh, cool. Jessica Murphy asked if anyone has solutions for sustainability when it comes to pet care. I don't know if anyone has pets, I do not. I have a fish, he's pretty low maintenance. <laughs> I, I kind of do something. So like if I, this isn't that big, but I think it helps. So if I have like a glass of water that I take to bed and I don't finish it, and instead of drinking the stale water in the morning, I'll just like pour it in my cat's water bowl. So, or I'll give it, I'll, I'll use it to water my plants, but I'm not just like throwing it down the sink. I also like how you can see your puppy like, uh, yeah, he's like, that <laughs> uh, Hey Brian, what's your, what's your question? Comment. Hey, um, I may, I joined a little late, so I may have missed this, but, you know, particularly, I guess when it gets to supply chains, like, but more generally, how do you think about like net effects? Like what advice do you have for research about like figuring out, you know, I feel like I can't come up with an example, but sometimes it feels like, you know, one action that people do to try to minimize their impact, you find out later, like actually has this unintended consequence and actually contributes to carbon emissions or something like that. Like, how do you recommend going about research to figure those things out? 
I'm I'm trying to deal with that for an internship right now. Um, I'm it was I thought it was a simple task of making some recommendations for more um, sustainable packaging options for an e-commerce company, um, and have found that you know if I up the recycled content of their packaging, then it's usually coming from across the country versus like 12 miles away where they're getting, you know packaging made from 100% virgin materials or um, how do you weigh uh, recycled content versus a supplier that um, you know donates to reforestation for every um, for every item sold I honestly having no resource like that I'm working with a startup so they don't have any money to go towards like larger software that could maybe do that analysis um, so I've been using as much public information as possible from um, EPA, GRI, et cetera, to try to, to do my best estimates. Um, but I'm just as curious about this as you are. So <laughs> there's, there's also um, more like kind of the gap equivalent of like um, ESG, like so in your sustainability report, um, there's a lot more, um, Kind of like standardization and regulation happening on you know when you report your your sustainability like what are your assumptions and what are you modeling and i think if you look through um like a bp or shell i think that one is like really helpful to understand because of you know how fossil intensive they are but like the different like primary secondary and tertiary emissions where it's like yeah they're giving you know fossil fuels to people who are burning it themselves so who who gets the emissions for that, you know, who has to claim those. And um, I think that can help, help you understand, like, am I just shifting this or am I improving it? Um, it can help a lot. That's awesome. Um, just a quick follow-up. Do those tend to be in like your typical, you know, annual report, quarterly report? Yeah, most like big companies have those now. And I know, especially like, You've seen with with big investors like uh, BlackRock, you know, talking a lot more about ESG. There is a big push to standardize, um, you know, a lot of those things because yeah, there's a lot of bogus claims out there. Thank you. Um, cool. Any, I'm gonna leave another pause for any questions from the audience. Otherwise, I have a rapid fire sort of wrap up question that I'll ask our panelists, but I want to give another opportunity for people to ask questions. And or I would also love if people have uh, links they want to share of either products they use or websites that they consult. If you want to drop that in the chat, I will add it to um, the sort of running list that I have going that I'm going to try to put out uh, as like a resource for Anderson in the next week. So please feel free to drop those in the chat or to Slack message me at another time. Um, oh, cool. I did not know about that search engine. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to assume this means there are no other questions from the audience. So I'm going to ask our panelists that very quickly as our final wrap up. What is the first sustainability uh, practice that you tried to incorporate? into your life when you started thinking about these things and and or what is the the most recent sustainability practice that you've been working on um so maybe we'll just kind of stay in the same order we've been doing so christina do you want to kick it off yeah um so the first thing i think was definitely recycling um my dad is a danish immigrant so we would always we'd go back almost every year to visit families so that's been a huge um, part of my upbringing and, and as you know, they're very sustainable there um, and I just remember from being a kid They had these and they have these machines here in the States, but they're just not as commonplace. They would have um, These machines where you could like feed it a glass or plastic bottle and it would give you money in exchange So I would always like go around and collect plastic bottles and then I'd go and buy an ice cream So that's one of my earliest memories. So um, I've definitely been doing that ever since I was young and then my newest are either my glass bottle cutter which I love, or um, propagating the plants, so. Yeah, 
My first thing I think was going, or first major thing was trying to go um, as plant-based as possible as many times a week as possible. Um, I think I saw an article that um, uh, I think on the New York Times that had said the, the three things that you can do as an individual that have the most impact are not own a vehicle, not have children or biological children and not eat meat. Um, and I was living in New York, so I didn't have a car, need a car, wasn't planning on having kids anyway. So cutting out meat was the logical next step. Um, and then as I learned more about it, I realized how actually important that is. Um, most recent thing, um, cutting up all my Anderson t club t-shirts to use as rags. <laughs> awesome. Um, the first thing for me was probably becoming a vegetarian at age 10, uh, even though I didn't really know much of anything about sustainability or the planet at that point, uh, or caring about climate change. Um, but actually, like, I think the first thing that I, um, with my parents being at home, uh, one of the first things I remember us doing that was like a, a new shift or a new project was composting. Um, my mom had bought a, I think two like composting bins, just like the tumble ones that you put in your backyard. Uh, and then us just saving food scraps um, in the kitchen and figuring out like what could go in there and then um, just taking them down there and throwing them in with leaves and turning the bins every so often um, was like a cool new project, um, especially if you have like young kids who like just being outside and playing around in, in the dirt and everything. Um, in terms of new things, I think it's, um, for me, it's, it's definitely been the shift of learning, educating myself more on policy um, and just like the importance of uh, the intersection of private sector and public sector um, in, you know, moving forward sustainability and climate change initiatives. Uh, I think that mine is um, just both of my parents growing up on, um, on farms in like rural Canada has like instilled a certain like thriftiness and like fixing things uh, similar to what Charlotte mentioned. Um, and I inherited my, my grandfather's like old toolbox of all of these different tools that is something most people would not be excited to inherit, but I was super stoked on that. Um, and yeah, so just fixing things and like learning how to, um, to fix and make things is kind of the recent thing. Cool. Um, and I will say that uh, probably the first thing I grew up in, my mom is like a fairly militant recycler, um, which is probably where I got it from. But I remember growing up, for example, anytime if you tried to recycle a piece of paper that still had, that was um, only had stuff written on one side, she would pull it out and be like, why? This could be scrap paper. Uh, and so that's something that like I always have a pile of scrap paper on my desk for making lists and stuff. Um, and just that mindset of like, don't throw away something until you've really used it to its full capability. Um, and then a recent change I have made just yesterday, um, and this was because I saw someone, um, a friend of mine who has inspired me in a lot of her sustainability practices was telling me she did this. Um, was starting an eat first box in your fridge. Um, it's just like I put in a shoe box in my fridge that um, any produce or anything that was sort of getting near needing to be eaten or leftovers that need to be eaten, put it in the eat first box as both like a reminder to myself that I need to eat that first and then also a signal to my roommate that he is welcome to eat that because it's in the eat first box. <laughs> um, and so I think that's been one thing trying to focus on reducing food waste. Um, okay, well, thank you everybody for coming today. I, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. I want to thank all of our panelists for being here and sharing their knowledge and expertise and their kind of various um, sort of subsectors within sustainability. And I hope that we can all continue this conversation. I know that uh, Stephen mentioned earlier that there's a few different Slack channels where some of this conversation happens. The C-sustainability is one um, where I think sort of like a more general interest in sustainability, but I also know Net Impact and EMG are also both doing a lot of um, sustainability stuff. So uh, thank you guys everybody for being here and I hope that you feel inspired to incorporate some of these practices into your life. Hi, thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.